Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 777, that is siete, 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 what's going on, how you guys doing, how you feeling, let me know, great, amazing, good to know, how am I, all good, all things considered, thank you for asking, all good, all things considered, thank you so much for asking, it's lovely to be here with you again. So how have I been? Pretty good, I'm not going to lie, I had another quiet weekend, no real going out, focusing on the work, banging out a bit of content, reading a bunch, watching some TV series which I need to catch up on because I've kind of been out of the TV series loop. I watched this new series called A Man in Four which I'm going to be talking about shortly and I've also started another show called Dark Matter, is it Dark Matter? I think it's called Dark Matter. Um, I've also got The Blood of Zeus season two has just dropped on Netflix so I'm looking forward to checking that out. There's a new John Mulaney um, TV show that I'm really, really, really eager to see and to check out because a lot of, there's a lot of hype behind that show, actually. And I'm a big fan of John Mulaney. I think he's incredibly funny. And ever since he kind of, you know, um, went to rehab for fucking cocaine addiction, I've loved him even more because it gives him a bit of an edge. He was always a bit too clean cut for some people's liking. I personally liked it. But now that I know he has a bit of an edge and he's now got over that edge and he's now allowing that edge to kind of be, you know, channeled into his flipping stand up. He's become a far more interesting, dynamic person for me. Um, obviously an expert joke writer. And from what I'm led to believe, he's got some sort of like, it's almost like um, a late night show type of model. And he's done it for Netflix. Um, I think it's Netflix or maybe HBO, one of them. So I'm eager to check that out as well. And of course, I'll be reviewing that for those of you who won't be watching it and will be vicariously watching it through me. All well considered. So I had a pretty interesting week, right? Where I went kind of viral on social media. Imagine, little old me, little old Agostino, right? This insignificant peon of a person, right? This black knight, this gorilla, this um hunk, this flipping toad this monster right this romero this romeo this um this uh loser this neek this bad boy this gangster all those things that people call me little old me little old me little old agostino managed to go viral and you're wondering agostino what do you go viral for i'm glad you asked i'm glad you asked my lovely listeners this is what i went viral for this particular tweet um, the person who I quote tweeted for some reason has disabled the tweets. So I can't really see it on my computer, but sometimes I can see it on my phone. So it's annoying. So I can't get a live play by play. But at the last time of checking, at the last time of checking, the tweet specifically had, if we're zooming in here, it had 9.3 million views. And I think it was picked up by a few other blog platforms on Instagram, but I'm not really using Instagram these days. But I had people, you know, letting me know that, oh, shit, I saw your thing on some page and shit. And people are, you know, reaching out and pretending I'm famous and stuff, which is obviously dumb. It's just a dumb fucking tweet I set out there. But essentially the tweet, it features a guy who posted a picture of his laptop and it's one of those old ThinkPads, right? And he says on it, LOL, look at the laptop they gave me at my new job. And I quote tweeted it and said, if your new workplace hands you a ThinkPad, you basically have a job for life. But if they give you a MacBook Air, you have the rest of your you and the rest of your team could get fired next week. And this obviously comes from personal experience. It's maybe a good observation, maybe a good joke there, but this obviously comes from personal experience. And it was a big wake up call for me because I kind of was one of those type of people who maybe looked down on jobs where they would give you a Dell ThinkPad. I looked down on those type of jobs. I always wanted to be in the startup in like a really fancy ad agency, working for a premium sportswear company, maybe a streetwear company, maybe a fashion company, advertising, marketing, whatever, right? And usually all those places, they always give you a MacBook Air or something along those kind of lines. Or maybe if you develop, you might get a MacBook Pro, but usually it's Apple way. One particular company I worked for actually, Big Up Mastered, RIP to Mastered, you're gone but never forgotten. They actually gave you a choice at Mastered. You could actually, I think it was actually free choices if I'm not mistaken. I think I tweeted and said it was two, but I think it might have been free. I think at Mastered you could either choose from a Windows um, laptop, a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro. The Pro you have to kind of like, you know, put in a um, request and basically fight your case for it. But essentially most of the time you got it. And they also gave you a license for Photoshop. Um, that's basically how I got to use Photoshop a lot. I'm not going to lie. No, actually, I take that back. That's not true. I actually had the cracked version of Photoshop on my old white MacBook. Remember when MacBooks, when they had that white one? So I had that white MacBook that I fucking beat into the ground. That was my absolute baby. 
I burned, and that was a time as well I started DJing. I was able to burn CDs on that laptop. It kind of started my DJ career on there. I started trying to produce a little bit on there, a little bit of video, video editing, but most of my Photoshop quote unquote skills came from using that laptop. Anyway, long story short, that's the only that's the only thing you kind of get. So there's a difference between usually, you know, Dell laptop think pads are usually reserved for like what you deem to be boring jobs, maybe working for the council, maybe working at some sort of recruitment firm or whatever. Something that wasn't the most creative, but obviously um, was a job that you had. And then with the startup thing, you maybe got more empowered. It was maybe more fancy. Um, like I said, you know, whenever I think of like at MacBook Airs, I'm thinking of offices filled with, I forgot what they were called, but in, in startups, they had these like black, I think it was a brand. I think they're called like bean bags. I forgot what they were called. Let me see if I can find them. Black bean bags. There was this particular brand that all the startups had in their corner. They're like a black bean bag chair thing and you could kind of move them around. Um, it was it was called a particular name, so I'm not too sure. It had like a red label on the side, and they were black, and you could kind of like move them around. It was like a company that did these things. I forgot what the actual name of it was called, but uh, but if you know, you know what I'm talking about. But every startup I worked at would have a few of these in the corner, so you could like sit and lie down and and do that. They'd have a ping pong table, right? They'd have like an outdoor patio area type of thing, right? Um, let's just let's just write startup offices. So you'll see the flipping difference, right? Startup offices. And I think a good example of a startup office is a WeWork. WeWork is basically what startups all are kind of aiming to kind of go towards, but obviously in a bigger scale where you have like, you know, WeWork had like a person downstairs who would serve you beer. They had like a coffee shop. They had a pastry bit. They had little rooms where you could do, you know, presentations, movies, uh, just all these nice little plush amenities and shit. But if you had a Dell ThinkPad, most likely your office just looked very corp very sterile, very dry, almost depressing. Just rows and rows of tables full of computers. But obviously, the benefit of all that stuff, you don't get fancy bean bags, you don't get drinks on Friday, um, you don't get, you know, you don't get a lot of the, you know, little added benefits you'd get working for a startup. But what you do get is job security. You get job security, and sometimes you actually get decent career progression. I sometimes think the whole startup thing about, oh, when you work in startups, you have way more ownership, way more um, responsibility on certain projects. You can kind of steer the ship. You, you can kind of steer your career in the direction that you want. I've worked in startups where someone who's worked in sales moved to working in customer service. Someone who worked in customer service, went to marketing. Like it's, it's more fluid, right? There's more areas to kind of move around. But I also think that's a bit of a myth. In the same way that it's a myth in startup world for you to work in a space where there's no delineation of like um, departments, there's no like rooms, there's no doors, everything is kind of open plan to kind of foster this idea of collaboration. But it doesn't actually do that. What it actually does is create more distraction. You don't get work done. Um, it, it kind of messes up the hierarchy as well a little bit. It's just not the best thing for like, um, what you call it for? It's not the best thing for you to get the job done day to day. You're kind of distracted all the time. You're easily kind of led astray somewhere else. Hear other people talking. It's just not the best place to focus. So I actually do provide, I actually do prefer the time that I was working in a far more sterile, in a far more dry, in a far more boring environment. Like I was working in Collar, this place where they basically were a big art materials manufacturer. And I was working there. That was, that was like my first internship I kind of had in an office. And I think at that time, they must have been paying me like, I'm not even going to lie. It might have been like 12 grand a year or something, right? After taxes, that's just underneath like 900 pound a month. And then my rent at the time was 600 pound. So I had like 300 odd pound to play with, right? Uh, uh, you know, well, no, not 300, but exactly. Well, not in minus bills. So I had not that much to play with, which is funny when I think about it because that was also the time when I went out the most. And I, and I think sometimes now that I have more disposable income, now that I kind of can do my own thing, and I live alone and stuff and whatever, I can kind of go, you know, do what I want and whatever. I'm not going out as much. But when I was at home and I wasn't earning as much, I was always going out. Maybe there was a part of me that kind of wanted to run away from home. But I think also a big part of it was just that you do way more with little. I think in general, you do way more with the little that you have. And I think I was really, really that kind of guy that would exhaust, you know, the, the hell out of a 20 pound note. So that went obviously quite far. So of course, that's, that's quite good. But I think in general, 
this kind of like pro- career progression thing is kind of, you know, again, over egged in startups because sometimes the lines can be blurred. Like I've also worked in startups where sometimes they promise you the world and never deliver. Whereas I think working for a place where they give you a think pad, you will know quick, pretty quickly whether you can progress or not. You won't get sold any dreams. You'll realize quite fast. I think in the startups, they'll dangle the carrot in front of you. You have this idea because you have ownership and because you're taking it on, you end up working way more hours. There won't really be a clear, I think with startups personally for me, there is no clear delineation between your personal and your fucking work life. Sometimes they can bleed into each other. You're answering calls at 8 p.m. No, you're still at work at 8 p.m. You're answering calls at 8 a.m. in the morning before you get to work. It can be a little bit blurry and a bit messy. Whereas working for a place where they give you a ThinkPad, you start at nine, you end at five or six, and that's basically it. If you don't get your thing done by the end of the day, just pick up in the morning. You know, that kind of thing that you, you get given that sort of responsibility. But I guess the only bad thing about working in, in a ThinkPad environment is that if you do fuck up, there's a lot more micromanagement. I found, especially even from my case, sometimes when you don't start the job on fire and they think that you're maybe lacking, especially if you have one year past your probation, they'll start micromanaging you way more. And then that will sometimes make you feel a little bit inadequate. You might feel like you're not being trusted. You might just feel shitty and dumb, whatever. And that could be hard to kind of get over. Obviously, if you, you know, love your, you, you know, have a bit of humility and make sure that, you know, you realize that it's not that big of a deal. And if you just improve your workflow and you just make sure your output's good, they're going to leave you alone. But that can be a hard to deal with. Whereas in startups, you can get away with doing jack shit in general. You can start in a startup, just be the fucking, I've done it before in my life and I can uh, attest to it. I've definitely been a, a personality hire at a couple startups, maybe more where I've never probably done that much great work, but because I was a good, positive, flipping, you know, influence around the office, they just kept me around for that sake. But I also think that's not the best way to go about living or the best way to go about working, especially if you want to progress your career. You're not really learning good habits. Um, it's not going to really stand you in good stead when you do go to another company where they don't really run that short shit because every place has a different type of, you know, working environment and culture. And some places they just don't play. There is no work, you know, there is no fucking personality hire. Everyone kind of earns their fucking, you know, earns their bread there. So you kind of have to acquiesce to that. But in general, I think the older you get, you start to appreciate the pros and cons of either working in a startup or working in a dry ThinkPad corporation type of place. But I think overall, if I had to go back in time and if I was focused, like now I'm obviously focused on doing my own thing. I'm focused on making this content thing full time. I'm focused on making the DJ thing work out. I'm focused long term on opening my own club. Obviously, in the process of writing a book at the moment, I've got all these things I want to do. So having a job job that I'm kind of progressing up the ladder and stuff isn't my main priority. But if it was, I would definitely pick working in a dry ass government job, local council, working for some energy supplier, working for some recruitment, whatever it may be that will give me a ThinkPad because that job security is everything. Because I can't tell you how nerve-wracking it is. And again, this is me many years after the fact, but it's funny that all the places that I worked at that were the coolest, I think of the Nike job I had, I think of the flipping job I had at Masters where I was traveling the world and shit, all of those jobs I had were the ones that had the worst job security. At Nike, we were kind of employed there, but not really. When we got paid, we got paid through this other company and you had to, to invoice them. And sometimes they wouldn't pay you on time. Luckily, at that time, I was living at home. Luckily, I was living at home. Luckily, I didn't have to pay rent or anything. Or, you know, I did have like a monthly thing I had to pay on a particular date. Obviously, I'd give some money back to the house, but it wasn't like, a oh, if you don't pay by this date, you get chucked out. But the amount of times when I was working at Nike where my payment would come late. I'd invoice them and my payment would come late all the fucking time. And it was a really important time for me to have that experience because I'm not sure about you guys, but if you, you know, if you work within a creative field, entertainment field, especially when you start off, for me anyway, personally, I was never lucky enough to work freelance and have that be the thing that was my made breadwinner no or the thing that i was never lucky enough to work freelance where it paid all my wages where it paid all my bills i kind of had to always work a regular regular job and then do my my creative stuff on the side but whenever when i was you know when i wanted to do it i had friends that were doing it that were fortunate enough to do that and you was always i was always a bit jealous like fuck man i wish i could be that person i wish i could be freelancing and do my own thing and sitting in the ace hotel on my little laptop and doing my thing or whatever it may be or going to shoreditch house and doing my thing over there or whatever and you know just being around carrying your fucking macbook and looking all cool but the thing that people don't tell you about working freelance is the money invoicing people to get paid 
There's nothing more nerve wracking than that. I swear to God, that kind of anxiety. Like, and again, I was I was living at home, so I'm lucky. I'm lucky it's not now because I don't know how I'd be able to deal with it. Not you know, not having received. Because I think there was one particular time I was working at Nike. We hadn't been paid for like three months, maybe four. Obviously, when it all comes, it's amazing. It's a big lump sum. But as you guys know, if you don't get paid on time and you get paid in, in as a lump sum four months later, you still have those bills that you didn't pay four months ago. And now all of a sudden, you've got this big lump of money. You can't really budget it correctly. And you end up blowing it far quicker than if you would have just got paid you know, per month as you should have got paid. And I don't think there was one time. I think there might have been one time, maybe when the store opened, that we got paid on time. Maybe like two months back to back and then that was it. Every other month was late, 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 or a big gap of four months. That kind of anxiety is just, I don't recommend it to anybody. So that's why if I could go back in time, no. If 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 I had to get a normal career job now and look to kind of progress up and kind of be a, a regular adult and get like a, you know, and build up my savings account and purchase a house and maybe start a family and buy a car, I would definitely go in the direction where they'd give me a ThinkPad. Because where I, a place where I'd get a ThinkPad I'd be more than sure, maybe let's say 80% certain that I'd have that job at least for a year. Because with startups, you can't even think a year ahead. You can't. I had the unlucky, I had such an unlucky period one time where I was working at Depop. I'm sure most of you guys know what Depop is, right? It's like a marketplace for vintage clothes and shit. Um, it's basically like the Gen Z version of fucking eBay. I was working at Depop and... I was working there and I didn't really feel like there was any career progression. Unfortunately, Depop's kind of culture at the time. Maybe it was my personality. I don't really know, but I didn't feel like I had the opportunity to move into another team. And the people on the other team, especially the marketing team, they were, you know, they were kind of wankers to be fair. Um, there'll come some people there who I liked, but this particular lady that moved there that became the head of the team there, she was very snobby, kind of up her own ass. And it, it was unfortunate too at Depop because for a while, we had a really cool crew of people there, employees that worked there. But then over time, people obviously became really popular and whatever. And then we started, you know, the company, sorry, we, they started hiring way more cooler kids and cooler kids with better CVs, with a bit of clout. They come with their own little attitude and, you know, bravado and shit. And it really did change the vibe of the office. I, I That's what I noticed anyway. It became like a... It became like any other cool place you'd work at. I'd imagine if you work at ID Magazine or you worked at some fucking creative studio, it had that kind of unnecessary, pretentious, snobby vibe. So I didn't really want to work in the marketing team. Now, again, I'm saying this, most likely they wouldn't have taken me anyway. Cool, it is what it is. But I didn't really feel like there's any progression. But I was working pretty well in the, you know, community support, customer support service area. I was doing a pretty good job there. Um, I was, you know, all right. But then I decided after a year and a half, oh, let me change jobs. And I didn't need to change. Depop, we, I was working at Depop when they used to be at this office called Zetland House in Old Street. Then they moved their offices to the office they got now, which is near like Liverpool Street. It's like a really spanky brand new office that they kind of built out. Everybody was really hyped about it because they really made it as a place to kind of chill. Um, let me see if I can get the pictures up on here. It's a really nice office, to be fair. It's got like this massive, nice pyramid thing on the front where you can sit right like as you can see here from the pictures it's a really well done office they've got a really nice reception area a nice little pyramid area here in the, in the corner where you can sit great meeting rooms loads of places to sit and eat and shit just a nice cozy type of environment right they moved into this office and we'd only been in there for like six months but i decided in my great wisdom oh i need to i need more the salary was too low working community support I needed more autonomy. I needed more, I needed more like responsibility. I needed to do my own thing. So I decided to apply for some social media manager role at this other startup. And I left myself at the time of registration, had the whole leaving party thing, was pretty cool. I moved to this new fucking startup and guess what happens? Guess my fucking bad luck. I moved to this new startup, motherfuckers. And guess what happens? Yeah, but you guessed it. The startup goes fucking bankrupt. I was there three months only after leaving Depop. Three months. And just before Christmas as well. Just before fucking Christmas, I went on I went on a little staycation to Manchester to have a have a good time, chill out and whatnot. Um book myself a room at the fucking Easy Jet. I've you know easy hotel, right? They have like an easy hotel there. Absolutely horrendous. Don't go there, by the way. Pay money for a regular hotel. That easy hotel is fucking terrible. And then I and then I was waiting for my money to come through that weekend to actually have extra money to spend when I was in Manchester, and it didn't come through. And then I went on the fucking, you know, slack of the company. And that's when everyone was just going off. I was like, oh no, my bad luck. I literally left a solid, comfortable role. Went somewhere else to risk it all. 
and I risked it and now the place is going up in flames and it took us a while to get our money. The company went bankrupt. We had to kind of, I think, no, so I guess the term is insolvent and you have to go through the government thing to get your money because it's unpaid wages and that comes through super late. I think we got our money like six months later and we only got our money or I got my money through some very nefarious tactics. Like I was on demon time. Like anything you're imagining, I did. And worse, do you know what I mean? So I was, I was playing with fire. I probably could have got arrested for that shit, the stuff that I did. But luckily that didn't happen. Um, but all of that happened because I went to like a startup where they, 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 they sold me a dream. Like, yeah, you're going to be leading the marketing team. You're going to be responsible for telling this story, um, inspiring people, connect, blah, 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 blah. I got a MacBook Air. I was able to walk in at nine in my cool clothes in this little office next to... Um, I think Holborn or something, it was like a co-working space and shit, like all this cool shit ne next to like, and I think it was near like some area where you could get like street food uh, during the during the week. They had like, like a little street where little stands were there and stuff. So all these cool, amazing things that tick off the boxes. But job security, whew, out of the window because after three months of being there, the company was kaput. I only really got two whole full payments. The third month I didn't get, I had to wait for it after the fucking, you know, deliberation or whatever else it went on so that was why after that i was like oh i had way more respect for think pack jobs because a think pack job would have never done me that dirty a think pack job would have given me a couple of months heads up a think pack job probably wouldn't have hired anybody because i'm led to believe especially nowadays thinking back at it there's no way they didn't know that they were on their last legs but they still hired me and why they hired me they didn't hire me because i was fucking amazing they hired me because they wanted to look like, because with startup, in startup worlds, in order to receive more investment, you kind of have to increase your employee numbers because it basically looks like you have demand or the app is going well or whatever the product you're selling, whatever you're doing is succeeding, which is why you need more help and you hire more employees. So if you have more employees, especially if they're diverse, I tick the boxes, um, you can look like you're doing good things and then you can kind of use that to raise a, another round of investment. So that's essentially why I got hired for. I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know at the time, but afterwards I was thinking, yeah, that's true. Like, there's no way they didn't know the company was on its last legs. So I learned a lot from that experience of like, okay, cool. If you want that autonomy, if you want that cash, if you want that coolness factor, if you want to look like a big shot with your little MacBook Air under your under your armpit, walking into Pret a Manger and ordering your fucking you know black coffee and shit, you, you're gonna it's gonna come with some risk. If you if you want beers every Wednesday. If you want fucking pizza on Fridays, ping pong tables, um, grassy lawns on your rooftop that you can sit outside and lounge on and stuff, it's gonna come with some job in in insecurity. Security, yeah, insecurity. You're gonna it's gonna be all over the place. So respect all jobs. All jobs are created equal. As long as they can pay your way forward, as long as they can support you, support your family, keep a roof over your head, keep warm clothes on your back, all that good shit, support them or you know, respect them. If you are in a creative field, respect that job even more so, especially if it's allowing you to do the stuff you want to do outside of work. Don't take it for granted like I used to and think you are kind of better than the role or I don't need to do this. Blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Have a good working attitude because if anything, having a good working attitude at your job that you don't actually like will actually translate into the stuff that you like to do because you just have good work ethic in general. And that's obviously something that you don't, you shouldn't be turning on and off depending on what you're doing. Um, you should do everything with excellence. Doesn't matter if you're fucking grocery shopping, doesn't matter if you're fucking cutting your own hair, everything should be done to a level of excellence. It shouldn't be like, oh, that's just, just that's enough. That's okay. It should always be excellent. And then that also should translate to your job. So happy I went kind of viral. Um, so big up everybody that saw it and liked it and left, left me comments and shit. I think at, at last fucking check, I had over 586 fucking replies. My notifications were going crazy. I felt like I was getting cancelled for saying fucking the F word or something. So that was pretty cool. And big, big up everybody out there that saw it. Big up everybody out there that saw it. Love and appreciate everybody out there who saw that damn thing. Moving on. Let's talk about A Man in Full. So there's a series on Netflix called A Man in Full. Um, the synopsis or the bio here on Google says, when a real estate mogul, Charlie Croker, faces bankruptcy, political and business interests collide, and he defends his empire from those attempting to capitalize on his fall from grace. What an amazing, 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 amazing series. I actually really bloody enjoyed it. Um, more so because of the depiction of how certain certain things in business can impact the regular man on the street and how different 
the circum no how different the circumstances are for each people the 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 the, the basically damages the guy charlie croker he's like this big business guy he's got this massive building he's got all these businesses we don't really know which ones but they're all over the place so i think he's got all these different factories and he's basically being you know charged with malfeasance and basically you know running off with the bank's money and not paying it back and even though he's going through that investigation and he essentially his legacy is all going to be tarnished and ruined, he's still able to fly in a private jet. He's still being chauffeur driven around in places. So essentially, like his quality of life hasn't been impacted on paper. He's obviously suffering silently because he's going through these little fits. His hands are twitching. I think I think they always say whenever your hands are cramping and stuff, it's like a sign that you are about to have a stroke or something. It's something to do with your heart issues if you're getting nerves in your hand. So I think that's why there's a little sign in the series where his hand clenches up. So he's going through stuff. And of course, um, it eventually leads to like catastrophe. Catch, catch, catch um, I won't spoil the whole thing for you. I'm kind of spoiling it already. But overall, a very, very good series, which I very much enjoyed. But almost depressing but i wanted it to be more depressing why do i say that i think the ending wasn't as depressing as it should be i think it should have went the ozarks way one of the reasons why i think the ozarks resonated with me and sat with me really well was because the family in the ozarks are horrendous i forgot what their names are the, the main family they're just as bad as the criminals they're just as bad as the drug runners as the brokers as the people smart they're just as bad as them but they have they don't face any consequences like nobody dies like obviously the brother of the wife dies but nobody in that immediate family dies which they should have but it also goes to show how often bad people get away with things and i like the ozarks how it did that how it's like no like sometimes the worst people get away with it and the ones that are kind of innocent are the ones that get hurt the most you know, in that other people within that kind of sphere, especially some of the, I forgot the trailer park trash family in Ozarks, the young boy ends up passing away. And it's obviously a really tragic death, but I like how the Ozarks depict that. And I wish a man in full would have done that towards the end, where it's like, nah, there is no like nice fairy tale bow at the end. There is no nice fucking pup, you know, muffin at the end with a nice little candle. No, sometimes the worst people get away with absolute heinous crimes. And that would have been nice to see um, as the series was going on, especially with the whole mayor, mayoral, mayoral candidacy going on. Obviously, as you can see here, there's a controversy around the scene where one of the characters whips out his piece and he's fully erect, which is funny because I was imagining like, how did he, how did he get the boner to film the scene? And when he did film the scene to get the boner, he has a fucking piece on him. He has an absolute weapon. That's like a forearm where he's exposing it. It's really out, you know, it, but it fits. If you watch, if you just read the headlines, it sounds crazy. But if you actually watch the TV series, you'll get that, that crescendo with that reveal at the end kind of makes sense. Obviously, when they write about it, it makes it sound crazy. But I swear to God, it really, really does make sense once you kind of watch the whole thing. So I really did enjoy it. Um, I really recommend you check it out. Really amazing series. Um, the main guy, what's his name? I did. The, what's the main guy called? Is he is he Jeff Daniels or something? I think that's his name, right? Uh, ba 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 ba. So it's, it's a novel by it's a novel by Tom Wolf originally published on November twelfth, and. Let's see what reaction other media. Let's see what they got here. So have they got the Netflix thing? Let's see if they've got the Netflix on here. Because I because that whoever's the main star in it, that guy is really flipping good, man. He is really good. He's in I think he's in that series called the the, the newsroom. Is this Jeff Daniels? Yeah, it is Jeff Daniels. This actor guy, he's so good. He can play that, you know, snobby kind of billionaire type guy really fucking well. He plays it. I, I think he's also an Interstellar, isn't he? Isn't he also an Interstellar? He plays the fucking guy that's ahead. Is it Interstellar? Yeah, is it Interstellar? What's the movie? Oh, no, um, that's not. What's the thing? It's not. He plays that movie that that Mars one. What's that Mars one called? He plays that movie where it's a Mars thing. Um, what's it called again? Ba, 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 ba. The Martian. That's it. Yeah, he plays. He plays that role well in The Martian as well. So big up him. Um, great actor. Fucking amazing. Really did enjoy it. A Man in Four. It's available now on Netflix. I really do recommend you check it out. Um, if you're into that kind of, you know, what what do you call it, thrillers type shit, please do check it out. Allegedly, it's also directed by Regina King. I remember seeing it in the credits. I was like, what, really? So allegedly, Regina King directed it or something. Let me just check the IMBD. Um, what do you call it, credits here allegedly regina king is a director of this fucking amazing series as we scroll down or scroll up 
what is it saying here? Video, stars Jeff Daniels, photos, Chastine. Where's Regina? Where is she? Regina. Is she not here? Oh, I, I don't, it, do, it doesn't say for some reason. It doesn't say where it was. But let me, let me see if I can write director here. And it can give me the Regina Ting. Because that was a really amazing thing to see. Okay, cool. Regina King fucking smashed it. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. So Regina King, on November the 4th, 2021, it was announced that Netflix had given a series order of A Man in 4, which is based on a novel of the same name by Tom Wolfe. The series is created by David E. Kelly and directed by Regina King, the two executive producers along with the Regina King and Matthew Tinker. So big up Regina King also for not doing what most female directors do when they have these sort of series where they make the women be like super women where they're the and they can do no wrong they're unfallible creatures like it's just annoying right that kind of diversity kind of checkbook thing regina did a really good thing because she presented the women in this series as strong women but in their own way not just like oh they can just crush anything they all have strength of, and again i don't want to spoil the show but they all have strength of character and resolve in their own way in their own situations it's very, very well done, to be fair, without being too of, especially the trophy wife that the guy, the main Jeff Daniel guy has. Like, she appears like a bimbo, but then as you keep watching the series, you see little clues that she's a bit smarter than what she looks. But she's also not like, oh, she's like, oh, like a savant or something. It's just in the situation, she knows how to deal with herself, how to carry herself. The other character, too, his kind of Finnish, um, you know, um, baby mother is also somebody that kind of carries herself well carries herself very well as well and very street smart so i love that depiction of women in this series so i really recommend you check it out it's called a man in full it's available now on netflix and it's a really really interesting series um maybe i might actually read a book by tom wolf maybe that'll be quite a nice one to read it kind of reminds me of um the title kind of reminds me of the what's his name of the tom ford movie what was it called what was it called again a single man yeah so a single man even the vibe of a single man kind of reminds me a little bit of a man in four. There's a, there's a similarity to it. Again, I might have to rewatch a single man. That was again when I was madly and I still am madly in love with Tom Ford and everything that he was doing at Gucci. Everything he obviously went on to doing with his own company, the business deals, how eloquently he spoke about fashion and the business of it. Like I was obsessed with Tom Tom Ford, literally up there with like Rick Owens. I read every fucking interview about him. So I might have to actually check out a single man again and refresh myself of how amazing that movie was. But anyway, big up Regina King, big up a man in full, available now on Netflix. Fucking amazing series. Really did enjoy watching it. And I recommend you check it out yourself because it was really, really, really good. Moving on from that one, we have to talk a little bit about Man United versus Arsenal. As you guys know, Man United lost 1-0 at home to Arsenal. Um, overall, the performance wasn't that bad considering how poorly we played against Crystal Palace. I thought we were way more compact. We defended way more as a team. We attacked kind of like a team, a little bit disjointed, but still we played way better. And the big, the big improvement I felt like was definitely this middle section. This middle section of the two centre-backs in Casemiro, Johnny Evans, and Kobe Maynard and Amrabat were a far more better unit, even with some Tomini, not really, no, it's got Tomini, fuck him. But these four players, I felt like, were a far more better and solid defensive block. Obviously, Casemiro was at fault for the goal. He didn't run back on side quick enough, which then led to the ball being able to go out onto the wings, which was then cut into the inside, which then led to Trossard running in front of his man and kind of finishing at the near post. Cool, very avoidable, but still... Still, I feel like considering how open, how poor we looked against Crystal Palace, to have this lineup and to have Amrabat play alongside Maino or to be the most deep landing midfielder and have Maino basically playing up behind McTominay was a far better lineup. The only problem for me is that it showed that Eric Ten Hag can be somewhat. It showed that Eric Ten Hag can use the players that he has to his to his that he has available in order to kind of get a particular result or performance because he's always saying in the media that the reason why we're playing so poorly, the reason why we're eighth and maybe going, going to be lower is because we have mad injuries, which I don't think is true. I think by the eye, if you watch United by the eye, you don't go just by stats, you don't believe the propaganda and the flipping gaslighting of the manager, you can see that even when, you know, um, what you call it, Lissandra Martinez was back in the squad, even when we did have a solid defensive partnerships um, or we didn't move or didn't change our defense too much, we still didn't play that great of football really in general we didn't really play that well so this idea that you know Lissandro Martinez is the one player that's set in pace and without him and Luke Shaw we can't play football is really dumb because there's been plenty of games where we've played Lissandro Martinez and Luke Shaw two left-sided defenders playing in that position and we still have played poorly 
The problem is our style of play overall doesn't bring the best out of the players we have. Um, and I don't think Eric Ten Hag has figured out where how he wants his team to play. Are we quick transitioning? Are we possession based? Do we have a low block? Do we have a mid block? Whatever. He has no idea, and it's all over the gap, which is part of the reason why I want him to be gone. But this particular game showed that he can make the best of what he has, even with the injuries. Because, you know, Amrabat hasn't really played that much this season. Uh, mayno has been basically exhausted. Casemiro's in the midfielder, can't play centre-back. But he was able to get the partnership right and jig it around. If it was up to me, and I was being the guy, and I was a, a manager, if you were if you were willing to, you know, name Kamwala, who just come back from injury, a young player, centre-back, I would have played him as centre-back. I would have much preferred to play him or another young um, academy player who's on the bench who can play defence in defence and then play the senior players in their favourite positions. I don't understand this preference of like putting, you know, midfielders in positions that they shouldn't be playing just because they're senior players. I hate that shit. I think um, Eric Ten Hag did the same thing with Amrabat when he first joined. Um, at the time when Amrabat joined on loan from Fiorentina, Luke Shaw and Malasia were still out. So for some reason, um, Eric Ten Hag played Amrabat as a left back. And obviously, it didn't help him because he's a defensive midfielder. He's obviously not as good as maybe he showed in the World Cup, but he's still a good player. But we're playing him at left back. So, of course, he's not going to play well. So, that obviously went to shit. Um, so, I would much prefer to see the, our senior players play in their favourite positions and then get the young players to fill in the gaps. That didn't happen. It is what it is. Overall, I felt like for all the hype of how people were talking about United and how we played, I also feel like Arsenal played within themselves. Some people would say they were scared, they were timid, but they were going for the league title. They needed to ensure that they got three points on the board. That was the main priority. It didn't matter how they played, they just wanted to get out of Old Trafford with three points secured. And they did their job. And I think, personally, they did their job not coming out of second gear. They were very comfortable. Um, we didn't really, you know, threaten them too much. And when we did, they dropped back a bit. They let us have the ball when we had it. And then as soon as we got maybe into their area or into the box they kind of attacked us and kind of let us go out which is different to what they usually do because usually they're a high pressing side that tries to get the ball off of you from when you have it in defense but this time around they let us kind of have it and they kind of load us into force into security and then obviously try to hit us on the counter cool so i think if in general if arsenal would have went for it they probably could have won by more but they also could have risked losing easily because we're one of those jammy teams that even when we're not playing well we can produce individual moments of brilliance i think a special mention has to be held out for garnacho i know he gets a lot of hate and against his decision making isn't the greatest he can be very greedy but his insistence and his ability to keep on attacking his defender to keep on going to keep on running down the line is really admirable and to be honest was the difference maker in terms of us being a threat and if anything he was the one player who I felt like was really going to make something happen apart from Ahmad Diallo, who I'll come on to. And the whole entire game, I feel like he had Ben White on skates. And Ben White has been one of the best fullbacks or best defenders flat out this season. And I thought that Garnacho really had the fucking test, had the beating of Ben White. He was going at him again and again and again and again. And most often than not, he was able to dribble past him. But unfortunately, the final ball, the final shot never really came off for him. But still, big up um, fucking Garnacho. I also want to give a big shout out to Amad Diallo. He hasn't started a game in forever for United. Um, he's one of our forgotten men. I don't really know why. Um, considering how poorly Anthony's been playing, Ahmad Diallo should be playing way more often for United. He's way more comfortable on the ball, you know, uh, keeps possession really well, recycles the ball really well, great close control. And if anything, he's very deceptively fast. He has very good acceleration, especially with the ball at his feet across five to 10 yards. Um, he can really impact things. I would prefer it, you know, if, if it was up to me, ideally, I'd like to see Diallo further forward so he gets the balls in the danger areas of the of the field and he's not so far back so he doesn't have to cover such long distances. But I think as a team, if you watch United, you'll see that our players have to run further. Like, even at this game, if you watched it, you'd see, you know, Odegaard kind of get the ball and be comfortable and pass it and the ball would kind of travel very quickly up the field without Arsenal players having to run. Whereas United players always have to fucking run a 5K to get the ball from one end to the other end because there's such big gaps in between our lines. Whatever. Let, l least of that, the better. Um, and also I have a big shout out to Amrabat. Amrabat's had a really hard time at United, Amrabat. Um, I feel like we are kind of in a weird place with May Knight when it comes to midfielders. We sign midfielders such as Amrabat, um, such as like Soberslai, well, not Soberslai, um, I forgot his flipping name. The guy that came from Dortmund with the long hair. Um, I forgot his name at the moment. But we sign midfielders and for some reason, we like to just let them go and keep the ones we have. 
So in the time that McTominay has been around, we've signed probably three or four defensive midfielders who we haven't really kept and we just moved on from. But I would prefer to have Amrabat as a squad option than to have McTominay as a squad option. Personally for me, he's way more versatile. He's way better in that position. He can defend better as well. And you just have, you can expect a certain level of performance from him. You can always expect like a 6 out of 10 from Amrabat, especially if he gets given games to play in his position. Whereas a McTominay is useless. This particular game would be a good example of it. McTominay got to play in his, I think, in his best position, which is in that number 8, number 10 position. Because McTominay is unfortunate in that he was born really tall and really big. So he's like six foot three, six foot four. He's obviously a really fit dude and really muscular and whatever. So people mistaken his build for a defensive midfielder. But he's not. He can't defend. He doesn't really have good spatial awareness. He can't read the game that well. But what he's really good at is those late runs into the box. Almost Frank Lampard-esque. So he's got a good goal scoring record for United and for Scotland for running into the box late. But apart from that, he's fucking garbage. When the ball gets at his feet, he doesn't know what to do. He can't pass. He can't control. Doesn't really have good dribbling ability. Even though he's a powerful runner, he's pretty shit. And shouldn't be playing at United. He's a player that is probably not even fucking Sheffield United worthy level. I'm curious actually to see what level of club Scott McTominay ends up at when he eventually leaves United. Because I think that's going to be a real big wake-up call to our fans to realise just how shit these guys are. When Luke Shaw leaves, when Harry Maguire leaves, when Scott McTominay leaves, when fucking Bruno Fernandes leaves, when Marcus Rashford leaves, when all these fucking cunts leave, we will realise pretty soon how terrible these guys actually were. So McTominay was garbage and he did this thing that I always hate with players. He did this thing that I hate with McTominay. Where if you've played football, you know what I mean. Where he kind of hides but he doesn't. So what do I mean? He will stand in a position where he looks like he wants the ball, but he doesn't really want it because he's almost like in between four different players. So he's kind of in space, but not really in space. And he was doing that quite often, especially after the first 15 minutes when I think his confidence kind of dipped. He was almost standing in these like no area, no, you know, these like no pass zones where like you're surrounded by four opposing players. Of course, no one's going to pass it to you because you're going to get tackled straight away. So I hate when he does that shit. Hoyland, unfortunately as well, not his best game. I'm a big fan of Rasmus Hoyland, but I think, yes, he's not getting the ball past him what, um, enough. There's a report that came out recently that says um, Rasmus Hoyland's teammates don't trust him. That's why they don't pass the ball to him. They don't think he's that good, which I think is preposterous. The fact that these players can, you know... Um, fucking determine who is worthy of a pass or not is ridiculous and it goes to show how um indulged how fucking ridiculous how entitled how much of an ego these worthless no accomplishing shit average players have on our team and the quicker we get them out the better but obviously as we have to thank the glazers for that but i understand where they're coming from to some extent because when Ram Tolan does get the ball he doesn't keep it well enough top strikers in the game nowadays if you can't link play you have to be a good point man so if you can't drop into a 10 if you can't drop into an eight position and pick up the ball and then spread it out wide similar to what harry kane does and shit then you have to be a good just battering man up front where things get to you and they stick unfortunately with hoyland when the ball gets to him at the front it doesn't stick whether it's at his chest whether it's head height whether it's on his feet it always bounces off and if anything watching this particular game he reminded me of lukaku i was watching this game i was like shit Rasmus Hoyland is almost like a white Lukaku in that if he's closest to the goal, it's cool because his instincts will kick in and you just lever the ball into the top corner. But if he's further away and he has to do something, he's completely shit and he just doesn't know what to do. He shits the bed. He, you know, he, he's got a touch of somebody wearing Timberlands when they're playing football. It's quite awful. So Rasmus Hoyland has a lot of improving to do. But again, I don't blame him also. He's a very young player. And he's been having to be replied upon because our senior players, namely Anthony Martial, has been out the entire season injured. He's obviously leaving at the end of the season, but those senior players who should be giving Hoyland a rest and allowing him to develop underneath him were not reliable and can't be counted on. So he's having to be the person playing all the time. And unfortunately now, especially I saw Cam say the other day, actually, we're using Hoyland like he's fucking James Beatty. He's running up and down the field, left and right. He's not, he's exhausting himself. He's not receiving the ball in space where he should get it. It's fucking awful. So overall, um, decent performance. Obviously the result, not what we wanted. The, the, the season is already over anyway, so I don't really give a fuck. But I feel like the gods were looking over us and blessed us because... At the end of the game, the fucking heavens opened up. And I think that was a good thing because after this particular performance, because it was only 1-0, I 
And a lot of us fans, especially United fans, are very, you know, you know, cynical people. We all thought we were going to get battered 5-0. So because it was 1-0, some giddy fans, especially some of those Eric Ten Hag sexuals out there, you fucking cunts, they were getting happy that we only lost 1-0. And they were kind of using it as a, oh, see, if you give him time, if you give him time, uh, we can do something. Okay, cool. The heavens opened up and it reminded us just how far away we are from competing at a top level. Because this showed where we are as a club level wise this fucking wet this obviously the heavens opened it started raining in manchester and obviously old trafford is in a state of disrepair it needs it, it needs to basically be knocked down and started again but because the glazers have been one of the worst owners ever in football they haven't invested in the restructuring or the rebuilding of or, or the repairs of the stadium or even building a new stadium so the, at the end of that arsenal game when everyone was giddy about the result we were reminded of just how far away we are from the top teams. Because look at this shit. Look at the inside of the change rooms in Man United and look at all the water leaking. That allegedly is a change room of one of the biggest clubs in the world. The change room of a club that has the highest net spend of all the teams in fucking world football. This is the one. Big old Man United has a fucking change room where it's leaking all over the roof. So this is an example that, hey, we have a long way to go. And the Glazers are have all the blame. They have all the blame to fucking take and accept for where we are as a club. And look at this at the end. This is at the end on Sky Sports News. It features um, Ayrton Hag clapping the fans. And look at how wet it is. Obviously, on, in the stadium, you can see the rain. But look at the way the rain that's coming into the stadium itself. Absolutely crazy. Miserable day for Manchester United in the rain around old Trafford. Look at that. Cracks appearing Everywhere. in the stadium. Cracks, it seems, have been there in the dressing room for... That was prophetic. That exposed everything the Glazers have been trying to hide with plasters, with plasters being shiny new signings, big celebrity managers and shit. Nah, the basis of our club is fucked because these fucking greedy... Um, horrible owners who've destroyed our club through 19 years of mismanagement and crappy ownership have now all the chickens have come home to roost because this is where we're at we have a club we have a stadium that looks like a stadium you'd see at Sunday league level where there's no fucking shelter that you've been opened up by the fucking heavens no fucking shelter no roof right R water leaking everywhere all over the place flooding all over the place absolutely diabolical for most of this campaign let's hear from Eric Ten Hag after a so you see that there's another video too that shows one more rain look at that water crazy and another one finally of people walking out how wet it was outside and then one final one but there you go there is the old trafford waterfall yeah see that look at that title may United have spent 1.19 billion on transfers in the past 10 years but kind of also avoid leaks famous now across the world uh they haven't fixed it yet and to jim ratcliffe who is here today can add that to the growing list Whip disgraceful utterly disgraceful but again i'm happy the season is somewhat over now um we can kind of concentrate on the summer and hopefully getting a lot of these shit cunt players out of our team hopefully changing managers and really seeing a change. Because I think the big example or the big hint for change at United won't be who we sign in. It will be who we sell, the outgoings. The outgoings will tell me a lot about what this current Ineos sporting ownership is going to do. Personally, I don't have any faith. I don't think you can have two masters. I don't think you can have the Glazers having the majority ownership of the club and then having a partial ownership to Enios who control the sporting side of things. I just don't think it works. There's no like flat hierarchy thing. There has to be a boss and a, you know, the all right boss all right over the top. And I don't think you can have two at the same time. But if it is going well and if it is the right thing, we will see it vis-a-vis -vis the fucking outgoings because we have to get rid of a lot of players in this squad a lot of players in this squad don't deserve to play for this club don't deserve to earn the salary that they're earning and are really stealing a living and they need to be gone asap and they're obviously toxic personalities and shit and are holding us back as a team if anything as well as a last point to make as a last point to make wasn't it interesting to see how much better as a team we played in midfield holding the ball without bruno fernandez yes we suffered because we didn't have the attacking threat um, there was no real balls over the top, no good shots on target, no late runs, cool. But without Bruno Fernandes as a midfielder, 
We keep the ball far better with Diallo, with Garnacho, with Amrabat, with Gmeno, maybe not McTominay, but those four players kept the ball far well, far much, well, far better than what Bruno Fernandes does when he plays. Because Bruno Fernandes does that thing that I always hate, where he always looks for that Hollywood pass around the corner. He's always looking for that quick ball around the corner, over the top, never really keeping possession, never really trying to dictate play, never really trying to go the, def the opposition out of position, always just trying to hit the ball first time, which I fucking hate. No control, no nothing, just fucking vibes over the top. But with Maino, Amrabat, Diallo and Garnacho playing together, that was amazing to see. So that was the only good positive, apart from that shit season, can't wait till it's over, and I hope the whole entire team gets sold in the summer, if I was being honest. Cool, let's move on. We have to talk about this article, courtesy of Allure, that features the one and only Willow Smith. Big up Willow Smith. Willow Smith has to be up there with maybe the Beckham's kids, with the exception of, I think, is it Romeo? Or, no, reception of Brooklyn. I think the Beckham's kids and Will and Will Smith's kids have some of the best behaved and the most admirable celebrity children out there, right? They are amazing. I think you have to give a lot of credit to their parents, how they brought them up. They don't seem like dickheads. They've seemed very well, you know, they seem to have a good head on their shoulders. Even Jaden, with sometimes his antics, they all seem to be decent people. Some people, like, you know, guys that you, you would end up bumping into and you wouldn't be, oh, this person's a prick, this person's a cunt. They seem fucking lovely, especially Willow. And Willow had some really interesting things to say. Uh, this is, I think, as promo for a new album. She's got this whole cover story here in Allure, where she looks amazing, obviously. Big up Willow. Um, always amazingly photogenic in terms of um, editorials and what she looks like. She's a great mix between her parents and shit. And just in general, as an artist, I've always been a big fan of her anyway. Very, very underrated. But she had a very astute and almost impressive um, explanation for how she feels being a quote-unquote Nepo baby. And I feel like she provided one of the best explanations for it that I've, I've heard from anybody. I swear to God, she was legitimately um, spoke about it in such a great way that I feel like this is what that needs to be fucking highlighted. So it's in this section down here where she speaks about it. So let me uh, get it up on here. So, um, so in this section, it says the following. That voice also drives her work ethic. Given her lineage, Willow is what some would call a Nepo baby. Yes, there are doors that have opened because she is a Smith as a last name. However, after some deliberation, we both agree that she doesn't quite fit the bill. First off, because of her determination and creative output are not exactly consistent with Nepo baby with Nepo babyhood. Say what you like, but Willow doesn't coast. Cool. We continue. Look at the makeup. Look at the makeup on her lips. I love the two tone shade here. You've got a bit of what's that like burgundy. You've got this lighter shade here with the glitter. They really did a number on her there as well. Nice. And I, I don't know if those are fake freckles, but the fake freckles as well work really well there. It says, I truly believe that my in my that my spirit is a strong spirit, and that even if my parents weren't who they were, I would still be a weirdo and a crazy thinker. She says. I definitely think that a little bit of insecurity has driven me harder because people do think that the only reason I'm successful is because of my parents. That has driven me to work really hard to try to prove them wrong, but nowadays I don't need to prove shit to nobody. Isn't that a refreshing thing to hear? Because you hear a lot of Nepo babies, especially the white ones, denying their Nepo babies in the first place, which is like, no one's saying, I don't think anybody, even the most uncharitable um, cunt of a person out there, is saying that being a Nepo baby automatically means you're going to be successful. There are plenty, plenty of children of famous people who've done absolutely nothing in life right? That's not a crime, but who have not really achieved anything that their parents have. That's the case. We know that to be true. What the Nepo baby thing is saying to me personally is I think it's more so a way to explain why some people find it harder to make it in some areas than others. Because especially in the creative field, like let's just say in my field, where it comes to design, where it comes to fashion, art, all that sort of shit, it's advantageous to be a Nepo baby because, but usually... That would mean that your parents have a job that allows you to maybe take more chances. Maybe you can intern at a gallery when you're 25 and not have to worry about your bills. That is a, that is a privilege and advantage that you get because you're an Emperor baby. And also maybe the gallery that you work in, because of the connections with your parents who also work in the art, 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 in the art industry, that could also allow you to get into galleries where maybe I couldn't get into as even a, an intern. So that's all people are saying. They don't, they're not saying that once you get in there, you're guaranteed to have a career being a fucking art buyer or having your own gallery. You still have to work and put the work in and show that you're able to do the job. Cool. 
But that first advantage of being born of a certain lineage and having somebody say, like your parents, oh, I can put in a call for you or I can connect you with this person. Those are not easy things to come by. Like I, I think some of you, especially if you've been in the, in the creative field, you know it's not easy to get a hold of emails of people that you want to get in touch with. Someone that you want to give you a chance or you want to hire you or you want to pitch something to, it's not that easy to get emails. But if you're a Nepo baby, you have emails, you have direct contacts. Maybe your parents go to the same fucking private members club. Maybe they're part of the same golf club. Maybe they go to the same whatever meeting, whatever it may be. Those things are what gives you the advantage. But obviously, once you get there, the hard work is still necessary. So it's refreshing to hear Willow say it in that way. Anyway, it continues. The second reason she doesn't fit the Nepo baby mold is more fundamental. Because she's a black woman in America. And no matter if your parents are on the billboards or if you've been the face of Chanel or Mugler campaign, which Willow has most recently signing a beauty contract with Dior, you can still walk into places and get put in your place. Very true. And that also lends itself to what Law Roach was talking about recently. Law Roach, the stylist supreme, who's the main stylist for, and the only stylist for Zendaya, I think we basically his only main client, was saying in interviews recently that essentially being a black stylist you're almost put into a box especially if you only deal with black clients in order to kind of you know make yourself appear more sophisticated and to show that you have better you know a better taste level whatever it may be you have to start working with white clients which is obviously stupid but he was making that point and saying that he actually took a risk by dedicating and committing to Zendaya because he could probably be far he could probably be way more high highly regarded if he did have a popping you know white person to kind of get behind imagine if Laura Roach was fucking styling Olivia Rodrigo for instance he'd be fucking out of here but he's had a slow build in terms of his career because you're kind of pigeonholed if you are black because of the, the scene and how it is. It's fucking dumb, but it kind of is what it is, which I kind of understand. But I still think you could be a Nepo baby if you're black. I don't think it's of its overall, but I understand what she's going at. Another one. There have, been ex there have been some experiences where I went into a place that I've worked in the past and my picture could have been up on the wall and they treat me like, this is a little bit out of your price range. Which is something that every black person's experienced, right? You go into a designer store, especially a luxury brand, you want to go cop something and they treat you like, like a hoodlum, basically. They treat you like a like a like like a street rat, whatever. They don't give you any kind of respect and they kind of view you first based on the colour of your skin and less about, you know, the strength of your character and what you're trying to buy. Not even sure of the character, but who you are as a person, all that good stuff, right? Or just the fact that you want to buy stuff and be a good customer. And usually as well, the really sad and annoying part about shopping in luxury stores is that sometimes you receive the worst treatment from black employees. Sometimes the black employees, such as the security guards or the sales assistants or the managers, are the ones that treat you the worst when you go into these luxury stores. So they're the ones that are jobs worth, right? They're working for Dior. They actually think as if they're fucking a part of the Christian Dior team when you're just working fucking retail. They take ownership of the brand and the store like it's their own place or you walk into their own living room and then they treat you, a fellow black person, like fucking garbage when really it's like, hey, if you're out of this uniform, and you've walked into this place, like me, you'd also be treated like shit. Why don't you want to, you know, rewrite that stuff and treat me good? But whatever, it doesn't happen. Cool, let's continue. She says, um, oh, you don't really belong here, she says. Being black in America, even with privilege, which I'm never going to deny that I have, you're still black. And I love being black. People would look at me and say, okay, well, her parents are this and that, but she still is like me. She's still a brown skin and we all know that that doesn't exempt you from anything. That's the place of connection. And that is really, really true, unfortunately. And I think you see a lot. I think you see it probably a lot more in the UK. I think in America, I think I mentioned it before in, in my Patreon, actually, about my reaction to the fucking um, Tom Brady roast. So check that out if you haven't already. It's available now on my Patreon. Tom Brady roast. I did a whole reaction of it. It's available there at patreon.com. Subscribe for only one pound um, per month. But I did mention that one of the great things I think about America is that when you when you ascertain wealth, you can kind of climb up the, the climb class ladder. Whereas in the UK, you can't really. In the UK, it's mostly about, you know, the, the stock, your blood, your family background, the name. That's more important. It doesn't really matter if you're a, like Alan Sugar is always going to have a ceiling. Doesn't matter how much wealth he attains. Doesn't matter if he's got a knighthood. You're still going to be looked at as like a regular East End council kind of boy. No matter how much money you have. Whereas I feel like in America, if you go from being like, if you kind of become a self-made person and you're a rags to riches person, you could essentially be in the same room as a president. Whereas in the, in the UK, you probably couldn't be in the same room as a prime minister. 
if you're not from a certain background, didn't go to a certain school, blah, 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 blah. But I also feel like here in the UK, it's very clear when you're a minority. They make it very clear to you that no matter how much money you make, you're also a minority. You're also Asian. You're also black. You're also this, you're also that. And it doesn't change anything, Unfo which is, I think, a good thing because it lets you know what you're playing. You don't get, I think, one of the bad things about American Dream is that you get sold a false dream that doesn't really exist. And once you get there, you realize, oh, it's all a charade. At least in the UK, even though it's bad vibes, <laughs> you get told very early on, this is your lane, stick it to it. If you don't stick to it, we're going to slap you on the ant. We're going we're gonna to slap you on the wrist and tell you to get back in line. So at least you know where you stand. So you can kind of, you know, get it how you live. Go where you're loved and adored and not seeking, you know, uh, acceptance or acknowledgement for people that are never going to accept you. That's probably one of the only good things about living in the UK without kind of relarky. Um, It continues. Uh, da, 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 my progression. No, cool. That's basically it. So essentially she kind of, you know, explained how being a Nepo baby is probably more advantageous if you're white, which obviously makes sense. But it's also a mindset a little bit. There's a mindset about it. But I've also kind of thought about it. Like, I have a bit of sympathy for them because it must be difficult, especially because basically being a Nepo baby means that your parents were excellent in their field. Even to have that Nepo baby tag, it means your parents were excellent. They were like high level achievers. They really did the business in whatever field they're in. So how could you ever emulate that? Like, you're the, you're, you're the children of fucking... Jada, you know, Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith. How could you ever top that kind of success or whatever it may be? The only way you can do it is by doing maybe what Willow and Jaden are doing. Kind of carving your own path, carving your own lane and not trying to emulate what your parents did. That's probably the only way you could really do it and even make any change. But I also understand and accept, you know, the pushback from some Nepo babies and they say, why wouldn't I go into the same area my parents have gone into if they've already laid the groundwork for me to already go into it? right it's you're almost disrespecting your parents hard work if you don't follow in their footsteps a little bit so i kind of understand that side of things as well so everything has its challenges there is no easy path to anything i'm sure that you know she's had to probably work doubly hard to prove the doubters wrong and to prove that she's valid and worthy of fucking praise and attention and whatever else it may be in the industry but i thought her explanation for nepo baby or nepotism in general was very astute and very well reasoned and again just wise behind her age you know so someone so young to sound so reasonable and sound so rational and sound so level-headed is very rare especially being the you know a, a fucking super celebrity especially with her parents especially herself as well being a notoriety that she is and i love the direction that she's going in music wise i love that it's all this kind of quote-unquote weirdo alternative very out there type of music it doesn't really conform to genres. It's almost genreless. I love that side of things. And I just love that in general, she kind of has her own voice and kind of moves to the beat of her own drum. So big up Willow Smith. Big up Willow Smith. A new album is out now as well at the moment. What's a new album called? I forgot. There's actually a new album. I need, need to actually do a review of that as well, by the way. But she has got a new album out at the moment, which is called... Uh, what's it called? It's called Empophagen. Empathogen, Empathogen as well. Check it out. Really nice cover as well. Her smiling in the front with an afro. So big up Empathogen. Her new album out at the moment. I think it's only like 10 tracks long as well. So a nice short one. I think it's 12 tracks. Comes in about 32 minutes. Really kind of concise album by the looks of it. I haven't heard it at the time, but I will check it out soon. I probably will check it out soon. So I recommend you do so too. I recommend you do so too. Moving on. Let's talk about this. So, um... I've kind of heard of Minted NY mostly through the founder's Instagram, oh, sorry, Twitter account. So the founder on Twitter is really big because he posts some really cool running stuff, right? So let me see if I can find it on here. Minted NY Twitter. Um, he's a really cool um, dude who runs really cool races and whatever it may be called. His name is Marcus Milioni. I think that's his name, right? Marcus Milioni. He has this brand called Minted, which essentially, you know, maybe the brand itself isn't the most interesting, you know, voice wise. It's kind of what you'd expect um, from like a New Yorker guy, right? Type of thing in terms of that kind of menswear preppy look with like um, penny loafers and slacks and varsity jackets and, you know, um, short sleeve button ups and shit. It's, it's a particular type of vibe, right? You know what I'm talking about if I, if I get the actual store up for you. But the guy's Twitter account is really cool. He's in that kind of group of like menswear streetwear founders who are into running. I think there's a lot of them now. I don't know what that is all about. There's a whole 
it's a, it feels like there's a trend or there's a crew of like streetwear menswear runners who are all buff and run loads of races and shit and you know always posted pictures of their vintage porsches and matcha matcha lattes and avocados and toasts and stuff it's really kind of funny but at, at least lifestyle wise it's a bit different to what i kind of grew up with where a lot of my streetwear heroes were people who kind of you know were basically degenerates right they were drug addicts they were alcoholics and shit uh retail mafia days if you know you know so it's quite nice to see like a different vibe with these founders where it's all about health and wellness it's all about creativity it's all about sharing of the process behind the scenes like there's a there's a cool little thing that he posted here actually where it looks like he's doing some sort of um stuff for the nike performance lab running on a treadmill with some latest running shoes and shit so a lot of like health and wellness and all that kind of good stuff courtesy of this guy that runs this brand called Minted. And they've also got this cool little advert here, actually, I'm gonna play for you. Let me actually get this up on you so you can hear this advert. This is actually a cool advert for the actual shoe itself. The title is uh, Minted in New York and Sukorni Pro Grid Triumph 4 will release on May 11th from 12 p.m. at the pop-up and online on May 15th. So let's watch the little advert they put together for the actual shoe they did with Sukorni. Whoops. Whoopsie. I don't know if I had it on the screen. Let me let me let me replay that and get back on the screen so you can see it. Let's replay from the start. I'm not gonna lie, I kinda missed this. This is what I was doing at Central St. Martins during my product design course. I kind of miss sketching. I kind of miss this, you know, ideation side of things. Um, you know, taking an idea from a sketch into, you know, some concepts, into some prototypes, and then kind of, you know, refining it along the way until you get stuff into, into manufacturing. It kind of gives you a respect for products. When you design products, um, when you go through the process, it kind of gives you a respect for how hard it is to get things to production. It's very difficult. And sometimes you make loads of um, edits and changes to make the production process easier, which sometimes can impact the overall look and style of something that you make at the end. And sometimes maybe negatively hamper it as well, but sometimes the customers don't know that because they just expect the thing to come, you know, look the way it does. So it's usually a really hard process. So I love that the fact that they are giving us this behind the scenes look at how they came up with the idea of this um, runner that they did together with Sukorni. And by the way, I'm feeling like I'm seeing after the Travis Scott, um, what are they called? I forgot what the name of them are called. But the Travis Scott shoes that came out recently, I'm feeling like there's a bit of a trend nowadays with like people bringing out shoes and using the adverts as a chance to kind of show you how they are meant to be used. Like a, they're like a cross training lifestyle shoe, it's, it's, which I love because my favorite era of like training shoes is definitely like 80s 90s kind of like like nike air trainer type of vibe bo jackson type of vibe of shoes that could be, are basically multi-purpose they can work on a basketball court they can work playing football they can work playing you know weightlifting whatever it may be all those type of things included involved in it and you're seeing a lot of this kind of in a lot of the kind of adverts and stuff happening with shoes nowadays, you obviously see it with the stuff that Nigel Sylvester does with his BMX and other bits and bobs. You're seeing with this, you're seeing with the Travis Scott stuff. There's a lot of like cross training lifestyle. Hey, you can wear this to the gym, wear this to the club, wear this to whatever, all over the place. I quite like it. Beautiful shoe. I really want it, man. It's really fucking nice. Love this. Look at the tape. Lovely. So that's that's obviously that, and obviously to give an idea on the brand and what they look like. Do you have the Do you have the apparel? Cool. This is it. This is the brand as well. Let's go on his website. 
for minted. Oh, it's actually closed now. You can't see it. But let's go on the Instagram. Let's see if we can see some images of the clothes. So I can give you an idea on what they kind of look like aesthetic wise. But again, like I said, think menswear, think APC, uh, think, a you know, ALD. Uh, yeah, um, that kind of style of clothing. So as you can see here, some regular hoodies and sweats, but you've got some nice varsity jackets as well here. You've got some nice um, cut and sew pieces, right? You've got some decent little bits here and there that Minted do. And you know what's really funny about this collaboration? This is probably the first time, and I love actually this hat is really nice too, the Flex Department hat, nice white slacks there. Um, this is probably the first time where a sneaker collab has made me more interested in checking out the brand's overall offering because it usually works the other way around usually you're already a fan of the brand's offering and then when they do a sneaker collab it makes you oh shit cool they get to do a collab because um if i'm not mistaken sneakers or footwear is the hardest and most expensive um thing to do when it comes to apparel and clothing whatever that kind of field is it's a harder thing to produce so that's why a lot of brands would rather collaborate with a footwear manufacturer or footwear brand as opposed to do their own it's really expensive to do um and obviously you can get your ideas out better with someone who's really got their own systems and infrastructure set, set up but usually like i said most of the time you're already a fan of the brand and then you're hyped that they're doing a footwear collab but in this respect i'm not really too familiar with the brand but i saw the but i'm familiar with the founder but then I saw the shoes and I'm like, oh shit, the shoes look cool. Now I'm into the brand. So it's kind of the opposite way, which is kind of a cool way to kind of approach and kind of come into the brand. Anyway, all of that being said, the shoe itself is gorgeous. So Corny and Minted NY link up for this Pro Good Triumph for collaboration. And to be honest as well, not to bring other people involved in this, but I feel like this shoe is what people were hyping the Hidden NY Asics to be. I think the Hidden NY A6 has become a little bit overhyped because I think Hidden NY is a bit of a shitty, you know, and a bit of a regurgitating platform anyway. So people were kind of shocked when they put out such a clean, modern colorway of a shoe without going all the bells and whistles. And because it's definitely the best thing they've done, right? They've not done anything better than this ever. So this was actually a really decent colorway of a shoe. But I think it was overhyped. And I think it was overhyped because what they were probably trying to go for was what Minted ended up doing with Sakorni. And Sakorni, again, it's not probably as well regarded or as probably as trendy as an Asics is. But in terms of a model, in terms of what they've done with this shoe, it's fucking beautiful. I'm not going to lie. If you zoom in on the details, you have this really weird kind of like plastic, almost, I think plastic rubber webbing over it. And you have like a mesh lining under it. So you have this really nice two-tone effect. You have these great colors at the front. You've got silver. You've got, and again, all these like 80s kind of like, you know, 80s um, cross-training aesthetic type of colorways in there. We have a lot of white, grays, and greens and shit. Very neutral tones. Again, kind of reminds me of this particular colorway of the Air Trainer Color Fills. Is it? How do you spell it? Air Trainer 1. Uh, claw there, there we go. This particular model, it kind of reminds me of this particular shoe and this particular style, um, where it's that this is like a classic quintessential 80s runner colorway of a shoe. So that essentially feels like where the inspiration may have come from. I'm not too sure if that's true, but that's what I'm kind of running with. Um, so the colorway itself is fucking gorgeous. You've got all these nice little hits there. You've got the New York motive. You've got the custom tongue. You've got the custom little label at the back of the tongue. So nice and little details all over the place. But again, what one of my cardinal rules when it comes to colorways free colorways or free colors are basically the way to go and that kind of allows you to kind of create like a modern shoe a simple shoe without going crazy and making it look like you put you know you fucking covered it in rainbows and shit so you've got nice greens you've got grays you've got whites and that's basically it those three colors are done really well and then they've also got this addition of almost like an off-white midsole it kind of reminds me of the days when I used to collect sneakers and we purposely um, use acetone on the midsoles to take away some of the painting so you could reveal the pure polyurethane midsole and then that would age out really, uh, that would kind of um, help the midsole to age a little bit better and darken and that would give it the look of like a vintage shoe that was left in storage for ages. So I think that looks really fucking cool. And again, I, I've never really been interested in wearing a pair of Sikornis, but I feel like this particular silhouette is fucking done very well. Even the instep, and again, th th this reminds me of like that apple it's kind of like an apple thing apple have this thing where i think it's like a tim um sorry what's his name uh steve jobs thing i think in the autobiography or some interview he mentions where his stepdad would make him paint the fences around their house but he was a stickler for making him paint the front of the fence just as good as he painted the back 
and that design philosophy or that kind of philosophy in general is what kind of went into apple that's why when you open up apple products especially some of their laptops or phones they have really beautifully you know designed and laid out circuit boards and shit it just doesn't look like a hop you know been clumped together type of thing so i like the fact that even though most people will only see the outside of the shoe I love that the, the instep as well has been considered and looks really nice as well. You've got this amazing, I'm not sure what this is. I think it's like a plastic guard on the instep. I'm assuming when you, I'm assuming this arch lock is almost similar to Flywire, where when you tighten the laces around this sort of area, it helps to kind of keep your foot stable. So that's pretty cool. So I kind of like that as well. And of course, you've got this really nice arch support as well here. It's kind of an exaggerated arch. So maybe it might not be the shoe for somebody um, that has a very low arch you might have to get an instep an insole in there to kind of help but in general it looks fucking gorgeous i'm not gonna lie it looks really really fucking nice so i really like this shoe and and i've also liked the this is a kind of a pet peeve of mine but something that a lot of people don't do but i think i really like this so on this particular shoe here you've got reinforced you've got one reinforced eyelet and i'm assuming this reinforced eyelet is at the point of real tension so I like that they've got one eyelet here reinforced with this little white silver ring where I'm assuming maybe over wear testing, this was probably the one eyelet that was probably ripping too much so they kind of reinforced it to make it stable so it wouldn't kind of rip off too, too easily. So I really like that look of it. And then they've also got some nice detail here on the back of the heel. A nice green hit again. You see the differences of the sole. You see, the, you see this kind of overlay which is almost kind of plastic here on the outside. It looks fucking cool. This again reminds me a little bit of the Adidas Climber Core. Is it Climacore? It was a shoe from back in the day that Adidas did. I think it's Adidas. Is it Climacore? Adidas Climacore trainers. It kind of reminds me a little bit of that. Yeah, there we go. So that that back heel kind of reminds me of this. These Adidas Climacore. So even that section of the arch support kind of reminds me of the Climacores and this little webbing as well. So that looks really cool. Um, and then we've also got another image here from the top, which is also my one of my favorite kind of angles for shoes to see if something actually looks great. And again, not overly pointy, not overly square, and a nice silhouette that you could probably wear, again, with training clothes. Um, obviously, relax as well with your lifestyle shit as well. So I'm a big fan of that. Love it. Um, let's read the blurb. The blurb says, a mesh lifestyle sneaker is still in full effect. Regards to the specific brand, it seems like, oh, okay. Anyway, Marcus Mil Mil Milinoni, independent lifestyle brand, has a knack for casual running apparel alongside everyday clothing pieces like hoodies, tees, mesh shorts, and canvas jackets alongside accessories like leather card holders. So teaming up here with the NY-based label made sense for the style aptly matches the pro-grid triumph easygoing personality. The collaboration tosses the lifestyle silhouette in a clean hues of white, silver, deep beige, green, and off-white. As you can see here, mostly three colors. Um, the white hues grace the shoes mesh components while the overlays are complete with metallic silver and deep beige. Then the midsole and the soles components see tones of off-white and deep gravy. Oh, deep gravy. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I'm thinking of gravy. That's some big back shit. Um, deep gray <laughs> rounding out the sneaker are minted and New York on the heels alongside the signature Sakoni logo in green and silver. Retailing $160 USD, the Sakoni minted NY Pro Good Triumph is set to release online as Sakoni minted in why on the 31st of may so really check it out i really do recommend him um really amazing shoes the guy seems really cool online as well he's a good follow if you want some running inspiration all that good stuff and the brand itself looks kind of cool and like i said i've come in the reverse i wasn't really that aware of the brand before wasn't you know, necessarily a fan of what i saw he posted but now that he's released his shoes i'm now looking at the shoes or the clothing with a little bit of a squinty dial like hmm I like this, you know what I mean? So I love the stuff, love what they're doing, love all the background stuff you're seeing with people or with him especially showing you all the ideation or all the work that goes into making the brand. You've got, look, posts regarding the work that goes into labels, that goes into some of the patterns they're using and the cuts and the prints, all really good stuff that I think a lot of people that want to buy brands now, they, oh, and also like this, look at this penny loafer. They've actually got a penny underneath the fucking thing. That's pretty cool. Um, so that's also really cool. So um, big up Minted NY. Really cool collection. Really cool collaboration. I love to see what they've done here. And I can't wait to see what else they've got to do in the future going forward. Really, really, really do like it. Can't wait to see more from them. Can't wait to see more. Okie dokie. Let's move on from that one. So we did a little bit of that. And now I want to move on to this because I thought this was a fairly important thing to kind of talk about in regards to clothing. So, am I the only person who's kind of bored of collabs in general? And when I mean collabs in general, I feel like nowadays every brand is collaborating, obviously because it's a easy, somewhat cheap way 
to kind of expand your customer base and to reach new audiences and to get more customers? Because in a way, you would say fashion brands, especially, they're basically going into the same pool again and again and again. It's kind of rare, unlikely they're going to get new fans of their clothes. You're just trying to remind people that are already buying your clothes to buy more of them. And I just think nowadays, there's just so much shit out there that I think sometimes, even though the clothes are nice, do they really need to exist? That's what I'm trying to think. Do they really need to exist? And I say all that to say, because I've seen this new collection, collabor or this new capsule collection with Dior and Stone Island, and as lovely as it looks, as beautiful as some of it looks, as well-constructed as it looks, as high quality as it probably all is, big up Kim Jones featured himself in a lookbook. Again, this is why I want to open my own club, right? This is why I want to open my own club, because Kim Jones, the creative director of, of Dior, has you know decided to put himself in a lookbook. It's the same thing that I want to do in my own club. I want to book myself to play every fucking single weekend, the same way Joe Rogan books himself to play at the Comedy Mothership. This is what happens when you run the show. This is what happens when you're the boss. You can decide you're the model. You can decide you're the stylist. You can decide you're the chief executive, chief financial officer, marketing manager, brand director. You can decide your HR. You can decide whatever you want to be. So big up Kim Jones. But all that to be said, as great as this looks, even this jacket, right? Look at the fucking quality of this jacket. Even from these pictures, it looks fucking lush. The leather looks fucking buttery. The cut is absolutely amazing. But does it need to exist? Do we have collaboration overload? Is there such a thing as collaboration fatigue? Two amazing brands, especially Stone Island, when it comes to outwear, Stone Island makes some of the best jackets ever. Um, you know, football fans will uh, abide by it, especially being all weather, all terrain. Amazing jackets, even for the money. They last for fucking ages. Great resale value also, if you're into that sort of thing. But does this need to exist? Do we need another Stone Island collaboration with another big, like... Where's all these clothes? What happened to sustainability, by the way? What happened to everybody caring about sustainability? What happened to being environmentally conscious? Like, where are all these clothes going to end up? In TK Maxx? In some skip somewhere? At the bottom of the ocean, choking a turtle? As great as all this stuff looks, like even that yellow jacket, absolutely gorgeous, right? This yellow trench coat, this yellow, this yellow trench coat, I'd wear the fuck out of it, right? The suit, probably not so much, but this yellow trench coat with the fucking... Look, look, at, the, look at that branding. That is... That's made for black people and Asian people. Black and Asian people are going to be all over this. Walking around with a sleeve that has a Stone Island patch and Dior embroidered is like the dream for label-obsessed black and Asian people. They're going to be all over this shit. But does it need to exist? That's the question. Does it actually need to exist or is there collaboration fatigue and overload? For me, I'm collaboration fatigued. Even though I like these shorts, these shorts are really nice. These cargo shorts with the pockets on them and shit. Um, the top is interesting too. What's that? Is that like, but oh, it's like pearls. There's like these rose pearl things, I guess, on there. Very Dior. That's one thing you're gonna get with Kim Jones. Kim Jones loves a bomber jacket. If there's one thing Kim Jones is gonna fucking design the fuck out of, he's gonna design the. He's made millions of versions of a bomber jacket. He loves a bomber jacket. That's one of his favorite silhouettes. But again, do we need another one of these collaborations? Aren't are we tired? Oh, this is lovely though. This M65, this yellow M65 jacket with the mesh bottom pockets. Ooh, hoo, 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 hoo. I'm, I'm afraid to find out how much all this stuff is, by the way. This this circular bag is also really nice. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the Telfar bag. Telfar made a similar, Telfar made a similar bag, I think with Eastpac. Is it Telfar? Let me see if I can find it on here. Telfar circle bag. I think they made a circle bag before. There you go, yeah. Telfar made this really cool bag with their logo in, as a circle motif or circle design, sorry. And it kind of looks a bit similar to what Stone Island doing um, with this particular bag that I'm showing you there. So, But obviously it fits the logo. So it's not like they copied them because it fits the logo. Um, so that's pretty cool. Or, although they could have made it rectangular to fit the badge look as well. But I quite like how they just did the fucking compass on the Stone Island logo itself, which again looks similar to the Telfar thing they did before. Uh, they've got an East Pack one and a Level one. But like I said, like, you know, we don't really need this, you know? It doesn't really do anything interesting. It doesn't really move the needle in any way, shape, or form. Stone Island could have done this themselves without collaborating with Dior. Dior could have done this without collaborating with Stone Island. The shoes are horrendous. But I'm sure there are some people going to be loving these, but I fucking hate these shoes. These kind of canvas shoes with the Dior logo written all over them. Personally, they're not for me. 
but I'm sure some people will like them. It's a nice cardigan here. Okay, not too bad. The actual colorway of the cardigan is quite nice itself, right? This kind of heavy red color, which kind of reminds me of um those Uniqlo socks you get in a pack. For, you get three for five or whatever. That, that kind of color reminds me. This is actually really nice. This set is actually gorgeous. I'd actually wear the fuck out of this set. This set is like a, it's almost like a salmon pink. And it's also got matching shoes. That set is really fucking gorgeous. That's really nice. It almost reminds me a little bit of the Supreme thing they did before as well. That's a really... You've got this utility vest with these really nice silver... I, I, I'm not sure if they're silver buttons or pearly buttons. But the buttons are really nice. I really like the big front flat pocket. So the front here, I think you can unzip... A, oh, no, not unzip. Maybe this is a, that's a pocket. It's concealed there. You can unzip it, but it goes around. So there's a lot of room. You've got big pockets here on the side also. This is nice festival wear. This stuff will go really, really well in the festival. You know, you'll be risky to wear this at a festival because it's obviously maybe two grams worth of clothing, but it's nice festival season wear. I also like the layering here as well. The proportions, the cuts are really nice. You've got this really diagonal cut there on the vest jacket, on the utility jacket. And there's also a nice strap there, actually, I didn't see. There's actually a good strap here. You can cinch um, the waist to give it a little bit of a designing pop. You've got, I don't know if that's a blanket in the, the arm that they're wearing or that's a scarf. Whatever that is, that looks kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, it's just, you know, another, more of the same. You know, more of the same. More of the same. I think I've got collaboration fatigue. I don't want to see any more of these, but I know these brands do it because, you know, it's easy. And it's a way to kind of market and promote yourself. You've got a bigger circle bag here as well that they like. But personally for me, I'm kind of over it. I'm over all these collaborations. I'm tired. This key ring's kind of cool, I guess. But I'm kind of tired. I'm not going to lie. Let's actually see the blurb. It says, collaboration efforts between Kim Jones have become the norm at Dior. Um, again, big up Kim Jones because he comes from a streetwear background, you know, so it's great to see him doing great things and obviously um, killing it over there at Dior. Um, it continues there. It says, during his tenure at French Luxury House, the creative director has brought in a series of big name collaborations, including the likes of Cause, Travis Scott, blah, blah, blah. Collaborations give way to Jones to explore modern tropes and intersections between high fashion and streetwear. Merging both fashion houses, conventions, and techniques, the collection is heavily influenced by military silhouettes, taking Dior's tailoring style, um, tailoring story, and collections, and finds uncommon ground between the two. The pieces are co-branded with both labels, signs, and symbols, including the double pleat originating from Dior Spring 20 Spring 1952 collection. Um, Stone Island's Dutch rope detailing Stone Island's iconic compass insignia is incorporated throughout the collection from badges um, on the bottom of the sleeves to the trousers and accessories in footwear the sneakers take on Stone Island's leather cotton satin make with a stitch Dior oblique patterns take a look and it's due to come out when's it coming out no no date no date on release yet so far oh no it is release date is going to be June 14th and July 4th so they're really pushing this early isn't it big promo run for this shit they want to get it out there to people to wear but i don't know how many people are going to actually see wearing it apart from people that get it for free but hey big up stone island and dior i guess but i'm tired of collaborations i'm in tired of collaborations moving on we've got this pretty sad story um you know thoughts and feelings go out to this young lady really thoughts and feelings go out to this young lady this is a really 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 tragic story curse of the new york post right this is to me heartbreaking i honestly can't imagine how this young lady must feel so curse of the new york post nyc concert goer bird pishi partially paralyzed after trophy eye singer stage dives into crowd can you imagine how tragic that is so sad a punk rock loving concert goer is partially paralyzed and can only move her arms after a singer launched himself into the crowd and landed on her head during a show in New York last month. I'm not going to play the video because it's fucking horrendous. Um, let's just continue. You can obviously imagine what that would look like. Um, Bird Pishi or Bird Pesci, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, Bird Pishi or Pesci, 24, suffered a catastrophic spinal cord injury at the Trophy Eyes concert in Mohawk Place, Buffalo, New York on April 30th, according to WGRZ. Footage posted on the Australian post on the Australian post punk rock, rock, rock band Reddit page shows the moment frontman John Floriani jumps from the stage and is perched up in the air by the rowdy crowd. That's obviously the lady. F fuck, man. I can't imagine. I really can't imagine, man. Bless her. Pichu's pink hair can be seen bobbing to the music near the front of the stage with others in the packed out 230 person venue. 
Filoni flies on the stage and in the blink of an eye, he lands directly on her head while others lift the lead singer, seemingly unaware she's seriously injured. The 24-year-old never reappears in the 13-second clip. The video is wild because unless you knew that someone was hurt in the video, you'd never expect that. Pichi's friend Leo Walter Chajeri told the outlet, like it's just an uh, it's just an average stage dive. Walter Chajeri said Reddit users who claimed to be in a crowd thought Pichi fainted and went to get her a cold rag. However, the show was abruptly stopped when other concert goers saw her still on the ground. She wasn't getting up and John the singer was like there, right there with her. Filoni rode in the ambulance with a devoted fan to Erie County Medical Center where she was rushing to emergency trauma surgery. Pichi suffered injuries to her spinal cord and her stay in the hospital was indefinite according to the GoFundMe page set up to help her with medical expenses. As you can see from the picture alone, look at that. She's literally standing right behind him. If you can't see the picture, the lead singer is basically diving with his back to the, to the, to the crowd. And he's basically, he's bummed kind of landed directly on her head and he's from what i uh, led to believe this um front man for this band is like six plus maybe six one six two so it's a big dude landing on such a small girl like fucking hell man like that's a young 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 lady like jesus christ she will need extensive rehab immediately after she was cleared says walter the friend to my understanding and the conversation we've heard so far from doctors is, is with catastrophic spinal injuries, you just can't tell and they have to take a lot of time to patients to see what the outcome is really going to be. Trophy I said the incident was shaking us all to our core. The really sad thing what I've read online is that allegedly the venue has told them not to jump from the stage. You're not allowed to stage drive. I think mostly because the crowd, the stage is so far away from the audience. I think they don't like that gap maybe. That's probably why. The gap in between. So they they encourage, but I'm sure they don't let anybody. I'm sure it's not encouraged that shows to stage that people do it anyway. But the way he did it was obviously super reckless and um, was just unnecessary. And it's just so unfortunate that somebody's life can change so quickly in the blink of an eye when they're going to enjoy themselves, watch their favorite band play somewhere. Especially nowadays, where you know concerts in general and people going out to see shows has definitely kind of leveled out and plateaued a little bit. For the kids to make the effort to go see you means that you're obviously um, doing good things and you're meaningful and you obviously make music that's impacted them and moved them to some way to kind of make the effort to leave their house to go and see you and then for them to kind of come back in a wheelchair is absolutely tragic um for both parties for the guy himself even though he was very reckless and he didn't take care and obviously you know you're gonna feel all sorts of anger to him you can imagine he's feeling obviously horrible about it you'd hope so anyway hopefully he's not doing a travis scott and pretending to be sad about it but for the lady herself I can't imagine, bro. I can't imagine how she's feeling. For that young lady herself, I can't imagine how she's feeling right now. Being a 24-year-old girl with your whole life ahead of you, and now you have to change everything about your life now that you've got this fucking disability you have to deal with. Maybe she gets better. Hopefully, fingers crossed, um, she makes a full recovery because you never know. It could turn it around and stuff, and she could get the feeling back in her legs and shit. But it's so fucking tragic. It really fucking is. Our respect for the family, we have refrained from speaking about this publicly so far, but with the blessing of the family, we are now able to say how truly heartbroken we are to be here. Our friend Bird is now in recovery, but still has a long road ahead of them. The situation has shaken us all to our core, and we ask for patience, and while we take a look to help help Bird navigate this time. And the really sad thing about it is that this is a band that's still trying to make it. They're not probably that well known. They're probably not even making that much money. So it's not as if they can even go inside their pockets and pay for all her expenses. They kind of had to contribute, which they did, $5,000. But they can't really do that much anyway because, you know, they're a, I guess, I would say indie band, but they're an up-and-coming band. Um, I think they are anyway. So, yeah, it's just tragic all, all over the place. Um, and this is like a proper, like, you know, uh, local place as well. Look, Mohawk Place looks pretty cool. Um, the bartender at Mohawk Place says the venue has not has had a strict no crowd surfing policy since 2011. There are signs posted everywhere in the venue and notice was included in the emails for the show and the show's promoter and the band themselves. So the the, the, the venue is basically blaming the band. You were told at, under no circumstances to stage drive and you still did it. Um, Mohawk's Place general manager Mike Four wrote in a statement to the outlet, Walter Tergeri, a musician, expressed the dangers of fans face um, to attract a high level of physical energy. The thing about mosh pits is that there needs to be a consent. The number one rule is a pit is if someone falls, you pick them up and that you don't pull anyone into the pit that didn't want to be there. The problem with what happened the most was there's no implied consent. The body was just falling down from the sky onto a person. Exactly. 
the mosh pit is one thing. If she would have injured herself in a mosh pit, that's obviously tragic, but also, you know, you kind of put yourself there kind of thing. But in this situation, from what it looks like in the picture, she's just standing in a crowd watching her favorite band like everyone else is doing. And then the guy just randomly decides to, with his back face to the audience, jump into the crowd and landed on her fucking head. Like, fucking awful. Do you know what I mean? So irresponsible. So tragically irresponsible. But it also kind of reminds me of this really sad story. I think it was during the pandemic. During the pandemic at this um, shopping mall we have here in London called Westfield, a young lady also got paralyzed and in tragic circumstances. I think if I'm correctly, if I remember it correctly, a shoplifter was running away from a store somewhere in Westfield, running away from security, and the shoplifter tried to jump from floor one to like, I don't know, floor two to floor one by jumping, you know, in the middle of a shopping mall, like over the barriers. But they jumped and then they slipped, their hands slipped and they landed on the ground floor on top of some girl that was just walking by. Like, fucking awful. Awful, awful. Can you imagine? You're minding your own business with your friend doing your fucking weekly shop or just walking around the shopping mall and some fucking shoplifter lands on you from the second floor. I remember that story and, you know, she ended up um, becoming basically paralyzed um but f for whatever reason she's had a very good attitude about it she turned it into a whole thing talking about you know advocating for for uh, d d disabled people's rights i think she had a blog and radio show she became like a bit of a a bit of a thing during the pandemic but i remember reading it thinking wow man how fucking tragic all of our lives have come to a screeching halt and now this girl's had being paralyzed because of this fucking tragic once you know in a blue kind of event that was kind of out of the blue but um in general with this kind of story i blame mostly the band the band guy the lead singer what a piece of shit personally for me i'd be really furious if i was a bird pishy's family and friends i'd be so fucking angry um especially considering you know he should have known better warnings were placed and again if you want to stage dive like you want to be a rock star you want to be like whatever at least go to an area where there's mostly dudes or something or guys that can catch you i don't know you know if you want to do that sort of stuff you're six foot something like you're not some scrawny little twink of a fucking lead singer you're a substantial big dude he might actually be the guy on the left here it might actually be, I don't know which one it is, but it might actually be this guy here who even sitting down in a chair, he looks tall. This looks like a six foot tall guy, right? Long legs, long body and shit. Even his face is fucking long. So for that guy to like, you know, go out of his way to kind of stage dive was a bit too much. And all these guys, they're all too grown to be doing that sort of shit. So if you're going to do it, at least try and do it in the direction of people who look like they can catch you or who look like they can kind of absorb your fall. Doing it in the direction of this kind of, you know, um, young lady is really fucking unfortunate. And something that shouldn't have happened and was easily avoidable if that guy would have taken some care and, you know, attention into the people that are coming out to see you and shit. Um, really tragic. Again, wishing her a speedy recovery and hopefully everything goes well. Um, really, really do wish that Beard Pishi makes a speedy recovery. Really, really, really do. Really, 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 really do. Okay, moving on from that one, we need to talk lastly about where am i going to get this from here bear with me seconds i'll try and get up on the on the thing we need to talk about this so skepta has some shoes coming out yes you heard that correctly skepta has some shoes coming out some brand new shoes from skepta are due to come out very very soon and i'm not gonna lie i'm actually excited about it i'm really excited about these shoes they look kind of cool so it's a collaboration with puma of all companies, of all brands. Skepta's collaborating with Puma. I think he's actually got a long partnership with them. I remember, if I remember correctly, he had some Puma bits and pieces in his collection that he did the, on the runway. I forgot what the name of the collection is. Don't get me wrong. It wasn't that great, really, to be fair. I think I reviewed it. But these shoes are fucking good. I'm not going to lie. They're actually pretty good looking. So this is to take a look at um, Skepta's new Puma sneaker collaboration. Um, the shape themselves, they kind of remind me of a Nike Air Max, is it a 98? I think it's a Nike Air Max 98 TL or something. I think that's what the shoe shape reminds, yeah, that's, that's it, there we go. That shoe shape kind of reminds me of this. Not too sure if this is the inspiration behind them. Um, I don't know jack shit, I'm just a fucking idiot on the internet talking out my ass. But they kind of remind me of this particular shape of a shoe. Supreme did a collaboration with them on that particular model a while back ago. But they kind of remind me of this. So they have this almost like, um, I don't know what you call it, topical type of design. These nice shapes in the front. With the Puma, they just don't have the different swells. 
but they kind of remind me a little bit of that but then the soul um is a little bit more substantial it's a little bit more of a rugged outdoorsy type of soul if anything the soul itself kind of looks more akin to something you'll see on the boot which actually is interesting because i think i would actually prefer to see this i actually would like to see this silhouette in a boot or like in the mid as good as it works in this low type of sneaker i also think it works really well in the boot type of sneaker but i also like the fact that it's got this iridescent two-tone upper about it as well which is really cool so you got these nice kind of you know hues of colors that pop um as well when you move it around i think also not when you provide flash onto the upper but i think the upper as well kind of reminds you of that what's that puma with a strap i forgot what the name of it is it oh that's it monstrous that's the one that's the one it kind of reminds me a little bit of the monstro so it seems like this shoe might be a hybrid from what i am ascertaining again via my fucking sneaker obsessed eyes it might be a hybrid of this classic puma monstros which i hate personally they've relaunched it again and it's become like a shoe that all the y2k obsessed gen z kids are wearing but i've always hated them they're essentially these pumas that have like a strap and they're laceless and shit like you know they kind of look like um shoes that eastern european men would wear personally for me i'm not really into them but people do like them nowadays especially with the whole y2k trend happening um but they seem like a mix between those puma most mostros and this particular nike air max tl is kind of the you know and then it births this particular puma so at the what well, i'm not sure what the name of it is actually but i'd actually have to see this again the shape of this put into a boot i think this shape would look really good in a boot i'm not gonna lie a mid or a boot level would look fucking awesome in this particular shape. So let's read the blurb. The blurb says, Boy Better Know Rapper Skepta is one of the UK's most decorated multi-hyphenates. The musician is often seen launching new projects, whether it be launching um, of his imprint mains, rejuvenating his career as a DJ, or directing movies. That's true, isn't it? He's actually had a pretty sick 18 months, isn't it? Mains back on the runway. Um, he did a whole tour DJing with Jammer and shit um, with his um, Mass Tiempo imprint. And then, of course, directing movies. I think there's one coming up soon, right? With um, Idris Elba and shit. So he's done pretty... Um, and, of course, Coachella recently. Fucking hell. Skepta's killing it. Having already made this mark of uh, the sneak industry with the SK Airline, with Nike before signing with Puma. Shit, yeah, true. I wonder... Th that's also why I'm wondering. Why is Nike dropping the ball with all these people that should be signing permanently? Like, I still think Sean Wotherspoon should be at Nike. Skepta should still be there. Those Skepta Nike... Air, those Skepta shocks back in the day... They, they they still they still self resell for quite a bit because i remember trying to buy a pair on StockX and they were going for still quite a bit of money those nike air max shocks that skepta did before they're, they're still pretty sick i think that was a really nice fucking reintroduction to this fucking um shock tl they were really nice all black upper with the red shocks at the bottom almost looking like air bubbles look fucking cool and of course the um what do you call it the air max 97s that he did are they, are they 97s that kind of, yeah this particular colorway one of my favorite nike Air max collaborations of all time so i'm surprised why nike didn't sign him on permanently and give him more shoes maybe he didn't want to sign or he wanted more autonomy because again i'd imagine working with puma same as what rihanna's got and asap rocky's got there i'm assuming puma probably give you way more money or they give you um what's that thing called they give you um stock options and shit which if you're an artist maybe after a while getting a flat rate fee isn't enough you want to secure the future of your family and you know kids kids and shit so having stock options probably isn't nice and having be able to get paid residuals but i'm surprised nike didn't decide hey we want to keep you because this shoe was fucking flames bro this air max 97 the fucking shocks before the tracksuits that accompanied it like this is like peak prime footlocker era of tracksuits and shit he could have killed it making his own collection sk air great tracksuits great matching sneakers great hats and shit with it as well but they dropped the ball as Nike always does. So now he's with Puma. Let's go. Um, it signed with Puma 2022. Fans were left on the fence, although the skeptical like this move made sense. However, with the amount of credit control seen on Big Smoke's new Finster, Skepta has made his new sneaker Puma entirely on his own. Is it? I didn't know he had a Finster. What's his Finster? Let's see what they're talking about here. Hype beast out here fucking stalking man's Finster and shit. Okay, cool. So he's got his Finsters called SK underscore scope. S K O P E ah okay nice so we get an idea so this is like his fin so he shows behind the scenes shit this is really cool oh yeah i remember so so that jacket that i remember seeing i think it's in the video i forgot it's a music video that he recently he's wearing this jacket and this is also a part of the puma collaboration it's got this amazing emblem on the outside it looks really fucking nice man 
that jacket is hard body i'd wear the fuck out of that jacket that is really fucking nice and then we're gonna see let's see if we see the um, design process of the puma shoes themselves you see skepta here doing a bit of styling on the shoes with some main track pants here they look really cool they look really good on actually they look way good they look much better on than they look in these product images which is a good thing i think if they look better on you're gonna see more people wearing them obviously influences the people who get them first and then people will be like oh shit i want them now and it's going to probably increase the sales you'd imagine they look fucking cool there i'm not gonna lie i actually like them they actually look really cool and you also got a picture here of central c wearing them too he makes them look good as well yeah they look really nice i'm not i'm not even gonna lie that's also a main jeans jacket fucking suit i'm not mad at them at all and he's also got a pair made for the babies out there as well they're babies them big up the baby dems cool we got that so let's go back to the article it says duh, 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 on these finster skeptics new design is entirely a new model with the first thing that jumps out coming in the form of the wavy overlays and the runs across the upper reflective detailing also applied with the fresh features including a looping around the full profile leaving the unique holes of the reveal back again i'm not sure if this is iridescent i think it's iridescent this glow i'm not sure if it's iridescent or something else but wherever it is it looks fucking cool um channeling some serious it almost reminds you of that i forgot what that ice cream was back in the day the ice cream with all the fucking colors you know warped into it again i forgot the name of it but we used to eat it a lot back in the day in the ends i forgot the name of it actually um it says here channeling some serious american cups energy skept to delve into deep into the puma archives for the inspiration behind his latest shoe i've seen the metallic undertones that can be seen when the light is flashed on the silhouette as well as the alternative yellow and orange laces they arrive at the sneaker all chrome box okay cool all chrome show there's gonna be an all chrome shoe box and yellow and what else laces that's actually going to make it pop really nice. Yellow and orange laces. I'm not mad at that. Rounding off the design as a customary co-branding can be spotted on the heel counter. Take a closer look at the Skepta and Puma sneaker collaboration, which is due to drop on Puma website on May 18th. Yeah, I'm not mad at these at all. I'm not mad at them at all. They look fucking hard body. Again, like I said, a probably a perfect mix between the MX-98 TL or TLs in general and also this classic puma mostro which has become the de facto y2k style shoe of choice so big up skeptor for smashing it on that one hard to do again when you're designing a shoe from the ground up and you're not just doing a retro it's hard to make them work because you've got so many resources you can basically do what the fuck you want so to kind of do something like this which is you know kind of minimalist kind of reserved not too out there it can be out there based on the colorway you can obviously flip the colorways and make this look fucking crazy and loud but i like the fact that it's done the way it's done and also actually like the lo the use of the logo that's one thing you have to give um kanye credit for with the yeezy line i think kanye was the first well especially now in the modern or the current culture to design shoes and not have the brand be the centerpiece of the design i don't think on any yeezy Maybe apart from the 700s, they might have some free stripes on it. You don't really get any signage that shows it's an Adidas. It just, you know, it's just a really nice design shoe. But that was the first time you ever saw a shoe designer deciding, especially in sportswear, not to have the brand, you know, stuck on the side somewhere, really bad, lo really big logo or very minimal, no, not a lot of no logo design. On it. And I think on this, they've done a really good job by in incorporating the logo into the stitching of the upper. So you got this Puma um signage logo here stitched in but you can only really see it when you obviously flash on the upper when you've got it like that you can't really see it too tough so it's kind of like plain looking so i think it looks really cool that's a good way to kind of incorporate the logo without making it the centerpiece and letting the design of the shoe and the shape of it speak for itself but again what do i know i'm just talking out of my ass i'm just talking out of my ass okay my friends that has been it axiom zinger show episode number seven 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 it's been a pleasure to have your company. If you've enjoyed the show so much now and you're listening to my lovely voice via the audio platform of the show, you know what to do. Like, leave me a five-star review on your Spotify app, on your Overcast app, on your Apple Podcast app, whatever you can do. Let people know that audio is king and leave me a good review. If you're watching the show live via the YouTube platform, thank you for joining. It's been a pleasure, never a chore. I'm going to re unlist the video and obviously edit the bits out I need to edit and obviously re-upload it for everyone else to watch with time stamps and shit. But if you are watching the stream regardless, please make sure you like it before you leave. That will be greatly, greatly, greatly appreciated. And as a way to kind of end the show, and to let you guys know what I'm feeling in terms of my song of the day, I'm going to actually play my song of the day here. And the song of the day for me is this collaboration courtesy of M. Honcho and Potter, pa Potter Piper. 
Potter Piper um, from their debut um, collaborative mixtape called 36 Hours. And the song that I want to play is Everything Personal. And again, um, I'm not really the biggest fan of collaboration mixtapes these days. They can be a little bit hit and miss. But on God, this one with paper pot with um what you call it um potter paper and m honcho is legitimately one of my favorite ones i've heard in a very 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 long time so please check this out it's courtesy of m honcho and potter paper the track itself is called everything's personal let me try and get this up here on the old youtube and then we're going to continue on and then you guys can go and leave and do whatever else that you need to be done but big up m honcho and potter paper big fan of those guys in general Let's end the show with some nice tunes then for us to listen to before we head off and do what needs to be done. But for now, let's play this song courtesy of M. Honcho and Potter Paper. One of my favorite ones from the actual mixtape itself. I'm sure some of you will like it when you hear it. Bear with me a second as it loads and then we can go from there. So big up everybody for tuning in. I appreciate you all and thank you for hanging out with me and I'll see you all again very 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 soon I take things personal yeah. I take things personal please don't get on the wrong side cuz I take things personal if I get stopped in a ride I tell them that everything's personal